I think part of you know being I know quote unquote forced or or needing to be able to play so many instruments is because of a job market also right you need to play every instrument within you know certain parameters that I guess you set for yourself but uh, those instruments are being learned for marketability right and the the chance that you'll get called for the the one gig by the one ensemble that plays that one piece right well and of course that, you know, in, in a in a decade you know that kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's funny because these actually it, it operates almost exactly opposite in the historical performance world right so in for those folks who are playing you know modern instruments of course you're trying to land that gig because your symphony orchestra is a modern symphony orchestra it's playing your modern instruments in the historical performance world the more instruments you play the more marketable you are i mean mm -hmm. that's kind of the yeah, yeah. the, the catch-22 here is you know, as a historical clarinet player, it's not enough for me to specialize on being really, really good at playing five key instruments, because guess what? Someone's going to need a Chalamot player someday. Yeah. Someone's going to need a someone to play, geez, late 19th century clarinets, who that's not really normal, but it's where I started, which is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. And you have to you have to have fluency uh, across the whole spectrum. Um, I mean, job market, that's <laughs> no, no one gets in historical performance, I think, uh, uh, for, for the money, especially not in the States. But, um, you know, there's there's a, a ton of work happening in Europe. And I really wouldn't uh, I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that, you know, playing historical instruments is sort of a, a niche or side thing. I would really encourage your listeners to explore groups like the Freiburg Baroque Orchestra, Concerto Kern, or notably for uh, wind music, Ensemble Zephyro. They've done phenomenal phenomenal work in really capturing the you know going back to what i was saying earlier in, in making attempts to capture the sounds of the the 18th and 19th centuries in, in ways that are really fresh on these historical instruments and you know even work that, even work that we're doing in, here in america with handel and haydn society and philharmonia baroque there, there's a lot going on mm -hmm. um, there's a lot going on i think it's easy sometimes to to get into the the rabbit hole of, of listening to the CSO or New York Phil over and over and over and over and over again. But one of the things that the 21st century, you know, has really done well for us is, is give us access to so many different ensembles that we would never have been aware of. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a huge benefit of, of things like Spotify or iTunes or YouTube, you know, explore, don't, don't get your skill locked down in the practice room working on those 12 excerpts. I mean, that's what bothered me so much uh, about studying clarinet the way that I did in my undergrad was it's such a, a narrow view that you get locked into sometimes. And it's necessary and it's important, but at the same time, there's a lot more out there. I mean, it, it, if you want to find satisfaction playing music, there are a lot of avenues to explore. Do you think that there's uh, an event or, or something that could happen in the United States that kind of digs some of this music out from the underground a little bit like yeah it, it's all present but you know to that extent it's not what it is in europe fully you know so is is there a way for it to become that or do you think the, the europeans are just more tied to it uh culturally and historically that it that bridge can't necessarily be uh gapped quite as much you know actually it's funny that you say tied to it historically right i mean this is one of the big reasons why i'm i'm interested in, in 18th century american music because i think we're just as tied to it i mean the handel and haydn society was founded in 1815 and, and of course the handel and haydn society today is one of the world's most notable period instrument orchestras but one of the biggest gaps i think american audiences have and there are again a lot of people who are interested in early music in america but the vast majority of american audiences who attend classical music i think would venture to say or i venture would say blah. <laughs> you know what i'm saying you know I, I think that the vast majority of people who are attending concerts today at say symphony hall in boston or at alice tolley in new york would say we're seeing some of the greatest european music ever played um, you know, that there is this big disconnect between what was happening in Europe and what was happening in, happening in America and in better understanding our own musical tradition, uh, and especially the way that you guys are doing and exploring 19th century band music gives us, I think, a, a better point to connect with, uh, historically speaking. It, it makes this music, in other words, relevant to American yeah, audiences, where, where otherwise we feel like we're, 
uh, consuming a luxury item that's been imported to us. And of course, it's all, always been imported to us, but the first you know, white settlers of America were imported to America. <laughs> I mean, if, if we're talking about the, the, the musical culture that, that we live in and the vast majority of people who now make up this country, we're not, <laughs> it's all import. Yeah. So uh, coming to terms with that identity is I think critically important to, to bridging the gap for early music in America and uh, especially to the later 19th century repertoires. Mm -hmm.